Okay, good to go. All right, so um, welcome everyone, and I'm, I'm, I'm delighted to be here presenting a project that's been funded by, uh, by the university uh, under a fund called the Longhorn Innovation Fund for Technology. Uh, the project is called the Cloud-Based Advanced Robotics Laboratory, and uh, this exactly uh, captures what we want to do. We want to connect hardware assets across campus that are expensive, unique, to everyone, everyone on campus, everyone around the world if possible. And for that, we have been a team uh, fairly large, uh, uh, myself, first of all, uh, leading this research, uh, but in uh, cooperation with the Faculty Innovation Center from the Cochrane School of Engineering, represented here by Fei San. And we have computer science as well, Professor Al Mok, who has been as well developing algorithms for, uh, for this uh, framework. But more importantly, we have had uh, graduate, postgraduate, and undergraduate researchers uh, of all sorts involved in this project. Uh, we have had uh, Richard Owens, first of all, uh, over here, which will be, who will be speaking. We have uh, Liang, Liang Fong, who's a postdoc. Uh, Fei San, as we said, from the Faculty Research Center. Travis Yado, a former undergrad. And Stephen Jorgensen and Dong Hyun Kim, who are um, elsewhere on campus here. And they're going to be actually remotely operating uh, dreamer and finally Greg Thomas who's uh, taking care of, uh, of, uh, of media today. The motivation for this project came about by thinking of first of all how expensive are the devices that we develop right this guy over here is about half a million dollars um, but also how unique it is uh, it's not only the expense but also how how much um, uh, specialization we, uh, we we endow in order to make it useful for research now this happens across campus in many laboratories what happens if every laboratory on campus could ultimately connect to some sort of web framework and then everybody could access, from a research perspective, all this hardware, run experiments, take data, publish, do reports, uh, share with friends, do it in the classroom, whatever, um, without at any cost and without actually to be, you know, going physically to that laboratory. Uh, so that was the motivation for developing CAR. The significance, ultimately, right, we think big, we we'll like uh, all campus to have these uh, kind of frameworks. We we'll like the entire country to have it. We we'll like the whole world to have it. And therefore, just imagine we'll have an internet of experimental, uh, of remote experimental laboratories. So you could say, say, oh, I have developed some motion, and I know there are many robots available on the web. I'm going to just gain control of them. I'm going to run the trajectories. I'm going to take data. And I'm going to publish a report or some sort of, uh, of paper. So that's, that's really how far we're going to go. And the first thing we're going to do is have here uh, Liang Fogg explaining what kind of technologies do we need to accomplish uh, these capabilities in the form of a front end, a branch of a browser, uh, which is shown here on a picture. And then Liang is going to briefly explain how, how this uh, works. Okay, thank you, Luis. So when we designed the user interface for the Cloud Based Advanced Robotics Laboratory, we really wanted to gain, uh, allow as many people to access the system as possible. And what that means is we want to have a user interface that is responsive to the type of screen that you're using, whether it be a large desktop screen, a middle-sized tablet screen, a small cell phone screen, or even a smartwatch screen. So we want to have as, as flexible of a user interface as possible. And to do that, we actually have to simplify things. So this is the user interface that we uh, have currently developed. There's a row of buttons at the top that allows you to specify your control points and your control objectives. Below that, there is a user interface that allows you to uh, visualize a 3D model of what the robot is currently doing, as well as webcam view, so you can also get feedback on what the robot is, uh, you know, what is around the robot. Um, of course, in the future, we can add many more sensors to be able to provide even more rich feedback. Uh, below the uh, 3D visualization is, is a sequence of buttons that allow you to tell and manipulate the robot. And again, this is just so that you can uh, specify how you want the robot to behave via the remote location uh, as if you were right next to it. And below that, there's a sequence of buttons that allow you to uh, execute software that you have programmed into the system. So you can submit software to us, we can install it, you can then run it on, your, uh, on our robot um, so that we can evaluate your, your algorithm. Um, and finally, at the very bottom of the screen, there's uh, the data feedback. And this is like the key scientific part of it. And, uh, in order to do anything scientific, you need to be able to uh, collect data, analyze it, and be able to compare your performance, your data, to other people's data, so that you can have an idea on how things that you have changed actually affected the real system. So that's the data collection uh, aspect of our, of our uh, user interface. Okay. Yeah, and I don't know if you mentioned that, but this runs obviously on a portable uh, device as well, 
and this is the most important kind of uh, uh, contribution to be able to run it across any sort of, uh, of device. Uh, so, so much for what runs on the front end, but something needs to control these, uh, this system. And for that, we use uh, feedback control systems uh, that are available in the literature, except that these humanoid robots are awfully complicated. They have a lot of more degrees of freedom than their industrial cou counterparts. Per arm, they have seven degrees of freedom, uh, so we have 14, and then it has three degrees of freedom on the torso that needs to be coordinated, uh, as well as the head movements and the grip <coughs> movements. And for that, we need sort of different uh, types of algorithms that were found in the literature. We use something called control it, which runs an algorithm called whole body control. And here we can see, sorry, I'm just not used to the side, the mathematics, right? We see there's a lot of algebra, a lot of manipulation. And kind of the research that we do in our laboratory, it concerns a lot of the mathematics, how to perform those operations at very fast rates so we can accomplish this kind of very precise uh, movement. But once we have these systems to govern the kind of the inner behavior, we have the front end, now we have to glue them together. So Leanne will be speaking again how the glue of these two subsystems is going to work. Right, so we have the controller, we have the hardware, now we want to be able to allow anybody on campus to be able to access our infrastructure. And to do that, we adopted the architecture shown here. It's based off of the uh, Node.js, which is a web applications framework that's used to power the most uh, successful websites there are today, you know, Google, LinkedIn, Uber, etc. Uh, these websites are all based off of Node.js. It's uh, bi-directional, so it's real-time, so you're able to uh, just interact with remote resources via the Node.js framework. On the left side of the architecture is what we call the Carl OS, that's the uh, Carl operating system, and it includes the simulation as well as uh, the real hardware um, that is controlled by the controller uh, framework. And to connect the controller framework to the internet, we develop something called the Carl Bridge. So the Carl Bridge connects to the Node.js web server, and then people from all over the world, all over campus, can then log into the web server via uh, the Node.js server to be able to access uh, our remote, our, our resources remotely. Okay, thank you, Liang. So now we have the pleasure of having here Bridget, uh, who uh, is an undergrad in mechanical engineering, and she's going to actually be using her cell phone, or actually my cell phone in this case, to do some cool stuff with Dreamer. So go ahead, please. So today I'll be using the cell phone. As you can see, it has the same interface as you saw earlier. All I have to do is go to the URL I'm using from right now. Once I press play and type in a password, it seems to be people from using it while I'm using it. And the viewer will get into the ready position where I can start to operate. So I can do simple things such as move the hands up or move them back down. <coughs> or use the pre-programmed demos such as waving at you.
we use the left hand, we take the can. The right hand delicately aligns the can. Now I can see. Okay. Let's start to move the left hand line. To the right first. Go down a little bit. One more time. Uh, push forward. Looks like I'm ready to grip it. Close the gripper. Forward. One more time. And one more time. Go to the left. Left for a little more. I think I need a one more time. And one more time. Go for a little bit. Go a little bit. Go down. Fold a little bit. <laughs> now it looks like I'm ready to open the paper. Isn't he in mechatronics?
continue investigating that kind of system. So go ahead and present the base, please. Hi, I'm um, Travis Yato. I did my bachelor's here at UT. I finished about a year ago. And the past, or the last year and a half that I was working on that, I uh, came to the robotics nice. lab and I started working on this robot here, Rocky. And we designed it from scratch, we built it from scratch. The purpose of Rocky is to enable Dreamer to move outside into the semi rugged environments that you know humans have no problem traversing, but are incredibly difficult for a robot. So we want to. Rocky be able to take Dreamer, mount Dreamer on top, carry Dreamer outside, and do all the things you just saw in a wide variety of environments. Now the thing about Rocky is it can move omnidirectionally. So we can drive right, we can drive left, we can turn in place. And once we actually finish developing the system and integrating all the sensors and the controls, it'll be doing all that much more smoothly. But uh, yeah, that's that's the goal, and the eventually once we connect it to Dreamer, we'll integrate this with Carl, and we'll be able to take all the demos you've just done and add moving around the building to that menu of options. Well, thank you very much, Travis. So this kind of makes the point of uh, <laughs> what kind of things we're aiming at, at uh, uh, offering this kind of uh, hardware assets that they are unique and expensive. We want everyone, everyone here on campus, first of all, to, uh, to use them with a special focus on undergrads. And you can see here that both Travis and, and, and Richard have been uh, tremendous enablers of these technologies. Um, so in summary, we want to connect students and professors, teachers in, in the classroom to these systems. We devise a web framework that could uh, allow to run uh, modern browsers in mobile uh, devices and you know, iPads, cell phones, computers run this kind of front end for controlling experiments with an experimental kind of focus. Um, we show how can we not only run the kind of the, the operating system for the experiments, but also how to gather data and how to transfer data for research consumption. We use some modern web technologies such as Node.js, which is commonly used for developing a group of uh, web frameworks, and uh, a car bridge, which allows us to connect with the inner robotic operating system that is native to the system for controls. And finally, we show a lot of experimentation here and demos showing how can we uh, teleoperate, how it can be intuitive, how can actually do very precise telemanipulation, um, how can we visualize and use the data, and what is our vision of, of the future. So we're very happy to show it here. So let me have a brief discussion where we're going. First of all, if we are offering these systems um, uh, across the board for anybody to use them, they have to really be encrypted, both at the software level. We have to prevent somebody from hacking and then suddenly robots running crazy and doing, you know, <laughs> stupid things, right? Um, not only at the software level, but also at the hardware level. Somebody could, you know, have to a couple of uh, uh, wires and then hook up to the electronic system and actually gain control and then do the same stupid things. That's first. Second thing we would like to have, we call supervised experimentation. So uh, this goes about somebody wanting to run an experiment, and two situations can happen. One there is, there is a malicious user, another one is a sloppy user, right? So he's trying to run uh, some fancy uh, demo, but it's not working correctly, and it's going to actually break the system. So we're going to have a, super, a supervisor that verifies the simulation version of the experiment before actually uploading it to the real system. That's what's called a supervised, supervised experimentation. And once is deemed to be safe, then permission is granted and then it can run in the real system. We want this to be adopted on campus and we're going to do that using the UT Robotics Portfolio Program, which is a graduate program mostly that gathers the computer science, aerospace uh, department, mechanical engineering, um, ECE, uh, as well as the high school. There is all this faculty. We're going to use it for actually having them connect their devices to Carl and offering to the students. We want also to be used off campus, and for that, I mean, other universities, for instance, or across the world. We'll seek partnerships, uh, we'll also seek funding, and some of the funding, for instance, might come from the National Science Foundation. We have in mind applying for something called the RED uh, proposal. RED stands for Revolutionary Educational Departments, and the UT Robotics Portfolio, which is a cellular department, is an ideal uh, program for kind of pushing these technologies. Uh, we would like to revolutionize the classroom in that teachers of the future, they are uh, showing some theory, 
And now they, they might say, let's connect to a telescope that is actually connected to a car system, or let's connect to an optics experiment. And actually, let, let's run this theory on those devices. Let's have you gather the data, and, and rather than having something that is uh, kind of non-dynamic or is, uh, is pre-staged, right? how wonderful it would be to have this kind of an internet of experimental systems. With that, uh, I really thank uh, everyone here for coming. Thank you very much, uh, all this team. And I uh, would like to open a session for a couple of questions if you, if you guys have curiosities. Please go ahead. Okay, in that case, um, we can look here and uh, please stick around. We have actually cupcakes, that's the most important part of the presentation today. Uh, lots of cupcakes. Uh, so please go ahead and also if you want to talk to all the researchers, see the systems, uh, play with them, just come over, okay? Thank you.